All right, you guys, thanks so much for being here for our first uh, OC Art Studios guest speaker. Um, today, I'm very excited to uh, share with you, <laughs> Stephen P. Neary. Um, Stephen and I met uh, through Cartoon Network. Uh, I was doing their graphic novels class and um, Stephen is so kind to join us for this uh, speaking engagement. He's gonna um, show us all about uh, what he does in animation. Uh, he's currently the showrunner for the Fungies at Cartoon Network, but uh, he's also worked as a supervising producer on Clarence and he's worked as a story artist for Blue Sky and his credits include Epic, Rio, Rio 2 and the Ice Age movies. And so today he's gonna be sharing with all of you um, what it's like to be a storyboard artist, how to pitch uh, storyboards and he's gonna answer your questions. So take it away, Stephen. Thanks, thanks, Larissa. Yay, this is awesome. Thank you for having me so Thank much. Thank you. Um, Larissa's class was so helpful because I don't know anything about making a graphic novel and I still don't, and I had a great time to your class. Um, but do people in this class, do you like storyboarding at all? Is anybody interested in it? Like, that's what I wanna do. Okay, cool, cool. That's great to hear. Storyboarding is like this big term and it can mean like so many different things to, and there are so many different kinds of storyboarding. Um, but I'll just, um, we're gonna look a little bit at feature stuff, a little bit at TV stuff, and then a little bit at maybe how to pitch your own show and kind of everything in between. And then we can go over questions and all that. But I'm gonna start just with this little intro kind of about me and how I, um, how I got into storyboarding because I didn't know it was a job for a long time. So I'm gonna to go to my, uh, my desktop here. I'm just gonna share this. Can, it, can everybody see this at all? This big who thing, like who are you? Yeah. Okay, um, we'll start with the basics. This is me, um, Stephen Neary. This is my weird picture and just we'll go with cartoon me. It's less scary, but I'm a director and producer. Um, on the show Clarence. I created this show called The Fungies also on, on Cartoon Network. But really, first and foremost, I'm a storyboard artist. So I've worked on like all these feature films, just just a lot of different things over the years. And I love storyboarding. It's it's the best. It's so cool. But I've had kind of like this weird journey to get here with a lot of sweat and a lot of uh, failure, definitely. So I, I was born in Indian, Indiana, where there are no cartoons. I don't know anybody who had ever like made a cartoon or anything about it. But I love to draw and doodle and stuff. So. I went to NYU to study live action filmmaking. Um, this was kind of around 2008, at like the height of the financial crisis. And I was so scared about getting a job because school is so expensive. And I thought, oh, I could get a job right now because I can kind of draw. So while I was still in school, I was working on like SNL TV Funhouse shorts and, um, you know, preschool stuff. I knew After Effects so I could animate on shows like The Wonder Pets, if you know who those are at all, if you have children. Uh, and then, so the Wonder Pets was a lot of um, flash animation or how? It was all like After Effects. After, After Effects, sorry, that's what I meant. So I got kind of good at that. And then um, I was like, I don't know, should I drop out of school? Should I just start working right now? Um, but then I really want to be closer to the ideas. I, I love like the DVD extra features where you show like people pitching their storyboards. And um, as a kid, I was like, well, my, my drawings don't look like Disney drawings, but you know, they kind of, there's a CGI stuff coming on that's, that's interesting. Maybe I have a chance just pitching like jokes and stuff. So I was really lucky I got an internship at Blue Sky Studios because I made just a lot of shorts and like After Effects when I was um, in school and everything. And then I, um, the only problem was this, this job was in Connecticut and I lived in Brooklyn. So I, I would just ride the train two hours each way and I would just draw the whole time and read. And it was like a four hour round trip every day, but I, I loved working there so much. And I just kept making um, shorts like on the train. So I'd plug in a light box. I didn't have a car, but I loved to run. So like when I was at the studio, I would just um, stuff all my DVDs into these like dumb party mail envelopes because you couldn't submit them on the internet back then for some reason. And I would, I would run like five miles and submit to festivals. And I was really lucky I got a short into Sundance and that kind of led me to getting representation. I got an agent, um, but I kept like running a lot. And then my career was just sort of like going nowhere. I was just like working 
on these movies that were really great, but I, I wanted to like really be a director and, and tell stories that were kind of what I, what I enjoyed watching. Um, so I did some soul searching. I even like ran to work one day. It was like 32 miles and I passed out when I got there. Um, but I thought about all these shows that I loved when I was a kid, like Dexter's Lab and you know, Powerpuff Girls. And I thought about the shows that were being made um, at Cartoon Network now um, or were being made. So I, I left New York to go work at Cartoon Network and um, I was doing storyboards on Clarence, um, ended up kind of becoming a director. Um, I ended up becoming showrunner for, for seasons two and three because of some drama. And um, this whole time I kept running because it was like a great outlet, just a, a physical outlet for me. And I, I started running these races like 50 miles, 60 miles, 100 miles. And it's really like, you know, it's like drawing. It's really 90% mental. There's some fun foundational skills there, but you just kind of, you do a little bit every day, you train a little bit and you get better. And then right on the other side of that, you know, you have these tears of joy, like you um, have these breakthroughs and you're so excited, like you're running for geese. Um, I remember one time like running this race in, in the Nevada desert and getting like buzzed by an ultralight plane and like running after them and like shouting at them. Um, or running this other race, um, I was like a mile away from the finish line at this 30 mile race and I, I stopped to pick flowers because I was just overcome that they were so beautiful and didn't realize like this person was running by and ended up getting the race so I lost because I'm an idiot. But the, the point is like, you know, storytelling is, is just more than cartoons. It's, it's kind of like your life, you know, um, and over the course of a hundred miles, you might have all these ups and downs, but it's also kind of like story structure. You want to see all these different twists and turns and things happening and building on that. So I, I love, you know, movies and shows about characters that are, that are pushing themselves, um, just trying and failing. Usually they're failing, but you love them for failing. So in Clarence and the Fungies, that's something I try to do. So all these things are about, you know, willpower versus mindfulness and destination versus journey, work versus play, like, What's your, you know, story style? What are those kind of stories that, that you really resonate, resonate with you and the kind of stories you want to tell other people? Um, you know, animation is so cool. You can see really the internal journey of somebody portrayed in these visually fantastical ways. Um, I love that in live action too. And like, you know, The Matrix is, that's a cool movie. Um, the Sound of Metal, I don't know if anybody saw that, but, you know, the editing and sound are just incredible about portraying this internal journey. Um, kind of like the limits of like physical and mental endurance and like genre stuff. Um, and, you know, all the ways we prove ourselves like against nature, this documentary is crazy. We're in a hotel, if you haven't seen it. Um, you know, what's our legacy in our life and how do we prove that to ourselves and our family? And, you know, they don't have to be like big stories. They can be small stories too, just about, you know, kind of, um, you know, strange people in their communities, uh, dealing with their families and their loved ones and trying to um, just, you know, win, win their respect. So, um, yeah, what's the payoff kind of, you might spend like 10 years or so trying to make your childhood dream come true, trying to make a show, but it's really like, it's not about that. It's about the people you work with. It's about, you know, how you all learn from each other, interact with each other, and um, just grow together as artists and just live your lives because animation takes forever. So, you know, I think it's good to see that we're all on our own journeys. It's hard. It's really hard. Don't be afraid to just try stuff and fail because that's okay. It's kind of the name of the game. And that's, that's the end of my little, my little intro um, spiel. But um, yeah, from there, can everybody see kind of, um, let's see, hopefully that, hopefully that all made sense sort of, but I'm just going to go ahead and kind of share like what my journey was like. Um, going from school and then into future and then kind of into television next. That sounds, so, that sounds great. I'm sure that'll answer a lot of people's questions. And, um, and if we have any more at the end, we'll get to those too. Okay, cool. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, that, that might have raised more questions than it answered. Maybe, I don't know. It did <laughs> absolutely raise some questions. Yeah, I'm definitely intrigued. So we'd love to uh, hear about that. Let's see here. Can, can everybody see my, my desktop? Yes. Now? I don't know if this is distracting down here. That's okay. Um, yeah, let's just dive into, this was kind of my like portfolio coming out of school. Um, I didn't know how to make a story portfolio. I kind of took my last year to just put something together for story, but it's a lot of figure drawings and um, just paintings and observational stuff. And this is back in like 2008. 
a lot of um, you know drawings, uh, just like single panel, like New Yorker type drawings, um, kind of weird ideas, and then just kind of storyboards. Um, these were from like films that I had made in school. I even went back and tried to redraw some of these just because I like the ideas, but the, the storyboards to begin with weren't very good because I didn't, I didn't really know um, how to draw so well at the time. So, you know, these were just like little pitches I was working on, some, um, some stills from, um, you know, shorts I had made and then other, this was, this was like a cartoon I made about a guy living with Bigfoot as his roommate and him getting like hair on the soap in the shower and stuff. Um, so just a lot of, uh, yeah, weird ideas. Um, uh, this is, was an invention, like a nose paddle boat. You could like sit on the lips and put your feet in the nostrils and, and drive around like that. And um, I submitted this and people, the artists there, they were really kind. They called me up and they're like, hey, we don't know what to do with you because you can't draw, <laughs> but you have good ideas. So we don't know what to do. I will guess we'll just bring you in and we'll see how it goes, but you have to get better at drawing or else we're gonna fire you. And I was like, oh, thanks so, so much. So wait a second. Now I gotta pause here and say that they saw the potential within you because you had such strong ideas and you were communicating the ideas in a way that was really interesting, but they said that your drawing skills weren't strong enough. Yeah, yeah. And I don't, I don't know that this portfolio would get me into a place like that either. There's this kind of the first year they had their internship program. So I just really lucked out. And then I had some other shorts that I had made. Um, one was like a musical that got stuck in everybody's head. So I was just kind of working with what I had really. Um, and yeah, it was definitely like a learning experience. And even when I was there, I kind of realized very, very um, soon that I was in over my head. So I started pitching like um, how a feature storyboard team kind of works is there's maybe like eight to you know 15 people and you're all getting these assignments from the director and the, the writers. And some people are getting like action sequences. They're really good at you know posing stuff out. And then some people are really good at like the sensitive emotional scenes. And I was just always getting these scenes just like, we don't know, just like give it to Steven and see what he does. So um, this was like an early um, pitch I did for like a flashback in Ice Age 3. And um, I was like, oh, what if it's 2D? So, you know, I can't draw <laughs> all like, I'll just try and make it really graphic and stylized because that's all I can do really. Um, so this was like a pitch of this weasel buck going like toe to toe with this Spinosaurus. Um, let me see, sorry, I think I have to select them all. Oh, oh yeah, maybe. Um, so this was like supposed to be this weasel. I thought, oh, I could just limit it to three colors and then maybe there's lightning that kind of flashes stuff. There's this giant like T-Rex shadow that comes in. His tail whips around. This guy hops over it, gets smashed. But then he grabs on, spins around, goes in for the punch and gets swatted away. Slinks into this cave here. And then we see like oh, dinosaurs right there. And says, pop goes the weasel, and stabs him in the eye and then gets crushed again. It's okay, under the rocks, swings again. It's kind of wrestling with this dinosaur's claws. And then the tail comes back and then just kind of uh, swallows him up. Um, so that'd be an example. I think that was the first pitch I did. And um, they were like, cool, but we like, we make 3D movies. <laughs> Like, this isn't what we're doing at all. So like, you know, I was just the intern. So I could, I could get away with stuff like that. But there were elements of that idea that they liked. You know, they liked kind of the atmosphere of it, how stylized it was. And they thought, okay, maybe let's give this assignment to somebody else now who's going to finish it. But, but we like some of these ideas. And, you know, maybe this intern kind of, kind of has something going. And we can just give them, you know, kind of assignments very early on. Um, so from there, yeah, I worked on, on Ice Age 3, and then I just kept trying to get better at drawing until I could sort of um, start handling like larger scenes, but usually they were always a little bit funnier and a little bit um, kind of weirder and, and kind of like unscripted. So this was a, this was a pitch for the end of Ice Age 4. Um, 
does anybody know who's like Scrat is, that little squirrel? He's, he's always trying to get from that, if that helps to, to break it down. But Ice Age 4, um, it has pirates in it. So there was like, the, the idea was the squirrel is trying to get like the treasure, this whole, um, this whole movie. So this is kind of the end. He's finally gotten to um, the end of the map and he's uh, looking for stuff. Let's see, let me just minimize this at the bottom so I can. Is it working? Okay. So he's um he's out to see. He's really tired. He's been out forever and he sees like, oh wow. It's finally there it is. And then we cut, there's a scrat on the shore. Ooh. Bless you, gravity, for I have just thought of a way to cure cancer. The scrat rolls in. He's looking at him. Hmm. They've like never seen other scrats before, and you see that he has like a crazy bit of foam. Fascinating. Welcome home, lost child. And then scrats, he's really uncivilized. He's like a caveman, so he just instantly like starts attacking this guy. <sighs> Brother, what a passionate and masculine greeting your culture has. It is wonderful to meet you too. I am so scratties. To the atrium and goes over to this like nut. Everything is like nut themed because they're squirrels. So <laughs> this little Leonardo da Vinci copter starts. Welcome to Scratlantis. Here you will not be hungry. Here you will not feel pain. Here you will not be alone. But meanwhile, he's just like looking around, and here we could kind of insert different gags around Scratlantis, like whoop, playing um, soccer with nuts. So oft have I invoked thee for my muse. They have like culture that's based around nuts, art museums full of um, nuts. And he just can't believe it. He starts freaking out. Uh, brother, you're salivating all over my cockpit. And he just freaks out. He runs down, he starts smashing everything. Rip. Ah. He punches this guy and grabs the nut. Bravo! Um, these guys are playing. He's like going in for the layup and then ooh, intercepted. Maybe this guy is just kind of doing a nut with the vending machine. And then Scrat comes up. He can't really figure out how to open it. So he just smashes it and grabs all the nuts that way. So this goes on like forever for however many gags you have. And then at the end, he's just kind of sitting on this pile of nuts and uh, he sees one last acorn. Brother, no! Oh! He's running, he's delirious. You see the golden nut You're running down the steps of this atrium. Wait, put down the nut, brother. I know how you feel. Grr. I know because I was once like you. Love, love saved me. Nuts are only objects, but with love we built this paradise. Now is the time to put down that nut and embrace your heart. He's looking around, my brother, take your hands in mine. And it's like, maybe, maybe he will. But no, he's not gonna do it. And he turns around and he, pop, it's like a cork. <laughs> All this water shoots out. He opened the bunghole. And the, the whole place sinks because he, he goofed it up. Uh, so he's drowning. Brother, over here. <laughs> Take care, brother. Be careful. And he's getting on the raft and just pops. Ah! Ah! You know, kind of revert back to the um, salts. So that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of an example of like a feature bird, I guess. That it's, was, a, that was phenomenal. It's been a while. So um, was that in, can I ask you a question? Was that in the Ice Age forum? Sorry. Yeah, there, there is, um, there is a form of this. It's, I think Patrick Stewart plays So Squatties, which mm -hmm. is cool. Um, there is like a, very, a much briefer kind of streamlined version of this. So this would be kind of like the first pass that I might do. And then um, maybe another artist might come in to kind of tie it down more and um, make sure it, it works. You know, mm -hmm. better. 
um, just because when I was doing it, it was more just like kind of gags and ideas and everything. Um, so that yeah. Was, yeah, that was kind of my my role um, working on this Ice Age movie. But yeah, I don't know if anybody has any questions about um, kind of future building or anything. I have more examples too. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and raise your virtual hand by using the um, pot, the little um, emoji thing down at the top bottom, and then I can see that you'll come up to the top of my screen. Um, but I do have a, I did have a question about that. Um, so when you were when you were given this um, this assignment um, or to do this, and was that all your? Did they give you a prompt? They said this is he's going into this world with nuts and you just figured it out. How much did they give you? Yeah, to go with? It, this one was pretty um, wide open. They knew that there had to be something amazing there and that you had to ruin it somehow. I think um, I think our script supervisor, Ed, he was like, Scratlantis. And everybody in the room was like, yes, okay, that's it, great, cool. Um, so it's got to sink and then you know that, um, you know that, yeah, just it has to be really good and it has to mess it up somehow. That's usually how all that kind of the scrap um, segments work. They're just kind of, hey, we've got four minutes here in between the main story to, you know, it's very kind of old school, we need to style, like Red Runner, it just kind of rules that he always had to, he could never win, basically. Right, kind of like Wiley e. Coyote was never allowed to get to the Road Runner. So yes. <laughs> that's the unwritten rule of Scrat is that he never he never wins. Yes. And so and in, it's basically all gags and or that creation of of that world with the nut being everywhere was um, that integral part of the nut being everywhere and everything kind of a thing that you came up with. Yeah, totally. Um... So that was just kind of, yeah, just, just building. And then, um, you know, you, you pitch several times. So you might pitch this once, um, one week. You might have like a week to put a pitch together. It's kind of rough. And then everybody looks at it and people throw out more ideas and more gags and then you might work on it for another week until kind of you've taken it as far as you can go. Um, so this was kind of towards the end of this when people are like, okay, we kind of get where this is going. Let's, let's take a break and focus on, on some other stuff. Um, but yeah, it was it was fun. There were also three other films that were a little less like extreme to kind of build up to this point. Um, I think an Ice Age five or Aliens of Love or something. Yeah. How many Ice Ages are there? I think five in a Christmas special. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I forgot to ask you. You're familiar with Raphael Zentil? Yeah, yeah. Worked with Raphael for a long time. Yeah. Do yeah. Do you know him as well? Yeah, we went to school together. Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. He's so, so talented. He was um, a big part of all those movies up for this guy. Um, yeah. He's, he's really good. Yeah, yeah he's good. It's I'm going to have him join us someday soon. So, oh, um, cool. but yeah. So, yeah, go ahead um, with the rest of the. This is really fascinating. I'd love to see more. Sure. Um, let me um, just share some more of that. So, I think, I think that would be kind of in the, um, maybe in the beginning of. A production, I might do more kind of brainstorming stuff like that. Um, but also there's sort of stuff that's a little more at the end of production, where say a lot of stuff has already been um, animated and we just need new gags to like kind of surgically like put into places sort of. Um, so this would be an example of that. Um, this, were, this was, a pitch I did, sorry, open all these. Um, you know, just some snail gags. Hey, we need some snail gags. And I don't even remember the setup to this. I think it was just these snails in this movie epic, Mub and Grub, like doing weird stuff. Um, I just had to pitch a bunch of gags of them doing weird stuff. So maybe he could, um, I think these are out of order. Maybe he could put his eyeballs in his mouth like this. What about this? Or maybe he could put his eyeballs in his mouth like this. Or maybe he could put his eyeballs in his mouth like this. Or maybe he could put his eyeballs in his mouth like that. Or maybe he could put his eyeballs in his mouth like that. Or just keeps going. You know, just hey, pick pick the funniest version here. 
of these gross snails doing weird things with their eyeballs. And one of them goes in the movie because we need to put like a joke right here. Um, so storyboarding is definitely um, a glamorous job. Uh, <laughs> um, it just seems as though you're just, you're just running the gag and seeing how many different ways you can get something funny out of this particular incident. And, and do you start off with a bunch of different ideas or do you just kind of go with one and then and, uh, it evolves as you're yeah. kind of going through the process? Um, I don't know. It's just, um, you just try and, um, you know that there's like a set amount of time where that gag can go and everything around it has already been animated. So you just kind of know, hey, we have three seconds with this in a gag. Like, can we do this? I don't know, can we do this? Can we get away with this, I guess? And then you just kind of let your imagination run wild. Um, but working at Blue Sky was great. It was kind of like going to, to grad school, really, because I could just draw every day. And I think, you know, for me, I didn't really realize, because I'm an idiot, that if you're a storyboard artist, you're going to be drawing like eight hours a day, um, just really being put through the ringer to the point where I was, I was waking up at night drawing, like my hand would just start going on its own and would wake me up. Um, but it was amazing. It was really fun. But I really wanted to keep kind of making films on the side. So I um, I started, let me just turn this on, I can share this. Can everybody see this? I don't know. This mm -hmm. was this short I made called um, Dr. Breakfast um, that, I mean, you can see how crude my, my drawings are that I ended up making on the train about this guy's like soul coming out of his eyeball. Um, at breakfast one day, and then these, these deer like give him a bath while his soul goes around the world and, and eats stuff. So it was just kind of like a chance to do, I think I was used to um, at work just being told like, hey, your ideas are a little too crazy. So I just wanted to see if I could make a short that was like as crazy as possible and then kind of animate it myself in a really simple way, um, a really economic way. Um, and then kind of submit it to festivals on my own. So these were other story artists. Um, you can see it on, on the Vimeo. Um, you know, just people I work with, like the Dean and you know, Chris Masco and stuff, voicing these deer. And then, yeah, I um, animated it on the train. There were like these, these electrical outlets you could plug in. Um, Wait, you so, animated on the train? Yeah, oh, that's Sandeep, he's an amazing. This is insane. Um, so <laughs> taking it to the next level. Yeah, I just kept doing that. And then, um, uh, you know, this was all this After Effects stuff that I had learned just in preschool television, how to do, how to animate stuff really, really simply and really quickly. Um, so it, it's a little bit tricky sometimes when you're, when you get a full-time job and you're trying to animate something on the side, it's just, it's all kind of about economy, like how, how hard do you need to try to get your idea across? Um, so for me, this was kind of, you know, this was like a background that I would just draw on and, you know, Apple invert and Photoshop, so you wouldn't have to paint it all that much. Um, to me, it was kind of about, yeah, finding the economy of this, like this is the bare minimum amount of animation I need to get this idea across so that I can make a film um, just by myself. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, that was that was the short I made, and then that ended up um, going to Sundance, which was which was really cool. Um, That's amazing. Uh, which which was, but then um, even at Sundance, I really um, I thought there was going to be like a job after you go to a film festival like that, like oh now you just get to make shorts forever. But there are only so many people that can kind of get away with it, like Don Hertzfeld or Bill Plimpton, and. Um, I realized I really didn't know what to do next after that. Um, so I started thinking about like working and you know making a children's book or something. This was uh, a book that I tried to make about Blender Dog, you know, just kind of applying those storytelling sensibilities that I'd learned from storyboarding and um, just applying those to open all of them, applying those things to um, a children's book, hopefully. So this is kind of, this is Blender Dog. He's, uh, he's the only dog in the world with a blender on his head, you know? But other than that, he's, he's pretty normal. 
He's just like any other dog and he gets into trouble sometimes. And um, the whole book would just be us yelling at Wendy <laughs> about stuff. Um, it's time to go to bed, don't drink out of the toilet. Um, until, you know, he's so bad that he finally feels so bad that he makes a smoothie for you. And he's a very good dog, actually. Um, so I think, I think I submitted that and they were like, this is kind of one note the publisher said. So I was like, okay, children's books, that's not my thing. Maybe I could pitch a show. Maybe I could do something like that. Um, so I just, like anything, like storyboarding, you just practice. Um, and I have, you know, just a very big folder of failed show ideas. Um, this was Dolphin Book Club. This is just about dolphins that read books at an undersea public library and they have um, kind of sassy opinions about the books. <laughs> and, uh, um, and I was just trying to pitch these to any executives that I met or something. Um, maybe they had kind of like a, a reading list that was a lot like a high school reading list sort of and these researchers up top were trying to understand like what they were doing. Um, I remember pitching this to an exec and he was like, I don't think kids would like this at all. Like I might like this, but but kids definitely wouldn't. So um, I just kind of kept um, practicing, um, just kind of more with character designs. These were some like crystal people, uh, maybe they could be in a show, but having no idea how to make a show out of that. I mean, this is very similar to like So True from the Fungies, but um, yeah, really just, just not having any idea what I was doing. Um, so I was kind of a little bit stuck. And then it was like, well, maybe I should try working someplace where they actually make um, cartoon shows. And that kind of led me um, to working at Cartoon Network. This was a really early pitch I did back in 2013 of what essentially became the Fungies. Um, they were called like the Microgalactics. And just trying to take um, you know, these character designs and flesh them out more with, hey, who, who are they? You know, why are they here? Um, what are they doing? Maybe they live on this meteor in this girl's garage and she is um, doing science experiments on them, kind of a little bit about maybe how they move, um, their, their feelings. You know, this guy turned into Pascal in the fungies. He's still very like kind of soft-hearted um, these, these twins could maybe split apart and stuff. And then there, there was always this antagonist, Commander Beefy, who was like kind of um, an intergalactic businessman trying to make money off. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, even that, I think this was, the show didn't come out until, you know, eight years later or so, but the, like kind of the seeds of the idea were there. Um, this was another thing that I made based on um, a student shirt that I made, uh, that chicken cowboy. Um, so it was really, really trying a lot of stuff. And at the same time doing um, kind of these TV boards. But um, has anybody seen the show Parents at all? It's a it's, it's, it's One of our, I know our teacher assistant, Eden's in love with Clarence. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, do you, would you like to see me a a television board? Yes. Um, episode. Okay. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. I know this going into TV world, but TV is a little bit different. The whole time I was working in future, people were like, hey, your work is too TV. And I didn't know what that meant. But um, and I took it to mean like, oh, it's too funny. I don't know. But really it just means um it's it's a little bit simpler, it's a little bit flatter, it's not quite as cinematic. Um, or evocative, and you're just trying to get the gags out really fast. So that's sort of um, that's sort of like what what I was doing with this pitch. I'll go ahead and, and pitch this one. This is um, this is an episode about playing a board game. So this this guy Breen comes over to Jeff's house, and they're all going to play a board game together. And it doesn't really fit into the dynamic, so that's kind of it. Um, Start outside, there's a storm starting. Clarence is like, what do you do with a drunken sailor? Put him in a lifeboat to these. Oh, I'm gonna skip ahead. This is Nikki Yang's. Yeah. So I'm gonna put this in there. Nikki Yang um, you know, is my board partner on Clarence. 
She's an amazing story writer artist. Um, she's also the voice of Eva on Adventure Time. Mm -hmm. and she's really funny and awesome. Um, so this is her section. And that kind of gets to my section here of them starting this board game. There's maybe an announcer here like, choose your characters. Whoosh. I'm Captain Blackhook Burroughs, feared captain of the high seas. House rules, captain gets plus three wisdom. Krusty Pete, Aster Gunner. This is Sumo, puts his piece in. Chaotic neutral. I'm Mr. Tobias J. Tobias. Make it a thing. I don't know. Um, this is Breen. You gotta pick a job. You could be the lookout, the swabby. Um, I guess he pans down looking at all these jobs in the rules. Can I be the first mate? Now give yourself a name. And remember, Mr. Tobias J. Tobias is taken, so you better can't pick that one. Okay. I'm the pirate Breen. Pirate. Here he stares. Your name is the Pirate Breen? Ah, oh, that's a terrible name. No, no, it's great. Uh, the Pirate Breen. Uh, I have to go to the bathroom. Tobias, Crusty Pete, you need to go to the bathroom too. What? No, I don't. Yes, you do. I can I can see you squirming. And then they go by over the conference in the shower. The Pirate Breen? That's a terrible name. I don't know. Who cares? Captain Blackhook? I was thinking I also want to play as a mermaid on the front of the boat. Ah, that's not a playable character, Mr. Tobias, but she's beautiful. Okay, you can play as her also, but it won't have any effect on the game. I said, like, yes. Um, so go back inside. Where's Breen? I'm right here, guys. Oh, great. Now that we're all here, house rules, Captain rolls first. Rolls. Set sail. It goes into this like really fast kind of um, action montage. <sighs> Clear skies, move full roll. Aye, Captain. <sighs> a, sail a sail comes loose, sending you off course. Uh, I climbed the mast to fix it. <sighs> well done, Mr. Tobias. Move ahead three. <gasps> a beautiful woman emerges from the sea, singing an enchanting song. <gasps> Fire cannons. <sighs> Critical hit. <sighs> Move ahead, five spaces. Avast, mateys. Marauders are attacking. <laughs> Fire cannons. I, uh, uh. It's a hit. A vicious marauder swings on board your ship. <gasps> Engage battle timer. I, um, I attack him with my pistol. <sighs> and the pirate brain misses. Oh. The Marauder sends the Pirate Green flying overboard. Move back two knots. Next time, use your cutlass. It's better at close range. Uh, uh, I use my rope to pull the Pirate Green back up. Thanks, Clarence. <gasps> Who's Clarence? My name is Mr. Tobias. Don't forget. Hey, no kissing on the poop deck. <clears throat> Dungay fever. Not it. Not it. Not it. He's looking at me. Ooh, too late. The pirate breed loses two turns. Oh, man. I am so sorry, guys, for back in the bathroom. It's my fault for bringing him. Hey, Jeff, why did you bring us to the bathroom again? Oh, he's sleeping? Sorry, our baby's sleeping. Everybody. That's great. That's great news. Uh, hey, Jeff, why, um, why did you bring us to the bathroom again? Yeah, there are no chips in here. I can't believe he tried to use his pistol. I don't know. Some people just have bad pistol aim. So it's in the bathroom. So these rats give me plus six protein. Psst. Use this to protect against scurvy. <gasps> Storm card. Lightning flashes. We cut to Chad's kind of like a non secular Clarence's house. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't be doing this now. <laughs> I'm going back inside. <laughs> Chainsaw comes back. <gasps> Crusty Pete. Um, a nasty wave sends you overboard. Um, he goes overboard. <gasps> Blimey! Shiver me timbers. He starts uh, cranking this shark crank lever. <sighs> and the shark starts it's like a little plastic piece. Fire cannons! We'd risk hitting you. We could um, create a distract. I throw my rope down to save Krusty Pete. <sighs> oh no. 
One of the sharks grabs the captain and pulls him overboard. Now they're both in the shark circle. <sighs> I don't want to die. There's so much booty I'll never discover. We have no captain. What do we do? What do we do? Dean gets, uh, steals himself. Look alive, scallywags. Uh, Tobias, do you still have that salted beef? Oh, yeah. Throw it overboard. You'll waste our food supply. The sharks are getting closer. We have no choice. Do it. Aye, aye. Uh. The sharks swim away, drawn to the food. I throw down my rope and pull them aboard. Yay, pirate green, pirate green. Let's get that treasure. And you see his pirate photo, like, pfft. he's all buff now. There's more montage than playing the game. The pirate green successfully trades our spices for the rare green amulet. A profit of 20 doubloons. That's a lot of booty. Enemy ships approaching from the rear. Ready the cannons. What do we do, Pirate Breen? I um, swing aboard and go for their captain. Grateful hit. Yay! Everybody um, loves the Pirate Breen. Almost there. Almost there. And the montage music. This is it. The dreaded Kraken be all that stand betwixt us and a chest full of treasures. I. Uh, now I've got a very specific plan of attack here. So listen up. Forget that. We got the pirate breeding. Let's ride this wave and slay that kraken. I attack. Um, we can't just rush in and fire cannons. It's like slow mo. No. Oh no, we missed. Now it's the kraken's turn. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like whoosh, whoosh. no cut to like the real what's really happening. Ah! <laughs> that was crazy. <laughs> They're all having a good time, but Jeff gets really mad. You insubordinate twits didn't listen to me. Now look. I'm sorry, Jeff. I just I thought we could you thought wrong. Do over. Whoosh. You can't do that. We're fish food. I'm your captain. You do what I say. Boink. You should be listening to me, not Breen. He's not even supposed to be here. Uh, and you start fighting. Guys, stop fighting. Clarence just sits on him. Uh, get off, Clarence. And Breen feels really bad. And I think we're in the bread box. Dad stays and the adults are playing. They don't even notice. Breen leaving and he walks out of the house. And then there's more than that. I don't know. We'll really stop there. Mm, so that's, that's a lot of, that's a lot of oh, thanks. Thank you. Um, but yeah, does, does anybody have any questions about pitching for television at all? It's you can kind of see the difference with um, with feature. It's like different. Oh, sure. Go oh, ahead, Michaela. Hey, I'm sorry. I wasn't sure. I know you said something about a raise hand button, but I would couldn't yeah. see it on my. Yeah. I Go don't ahead, know Michaela. How you zoom it out. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, not a, me neither, trust me. Um, so my question is, I put it in the Discord that we're in as well. Go ahead and ask it, go ahead and ask. Okay, I'm gonna reference it so I can make sure I ask yeah. everything I'm in there real quick. Give me two seconds, sorry. Uh, where are we? So I am in the process of putting together a, uh, a storyboard for a, a pitch that mm -hmm. my friend is putting together. Um, he has the script already complete everything's good my thing was i'm debating as to whether or not we should focus on maybe like a couple of important scenes because it's kind of like a full close to a 30 minute episode yeah yeah so i'm like should we focus on a couple of specific things or should we just go ahead and like board the entirety of the of yeah. the script oh oh don't do that <laughs> that'll take so long <laughs> okay gotcha um but that's great. I mean, it's great to write the whole thing and so you know where the characters are going, everything. Um, you know, so it's not a problem to have the whole script, but just just because um, you know, words, um, words are words are cheap, but drawings, you know, take take a while. So definitely um just try and think about the scenes that are gonna kind of showcase your skills the best. And maybe um, you know, if there's an action scene, if you want to do like a, a scene with some jokes in it or something, or sensitive scene just whatever is going to highlight your strengths the most i'd say um because for a portfolio it's not like um 
we don't have to worry about the rest of the cartoon. We don't have to worry about it getting made. We just have to make sure it's like really entertaining and, um, and funny and charming and stuff, which, you know, that's, that's hard enough on its own. So yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about making the whole thing. Um, yeah, but that's a great question, definitely. I appreciate that. I guess my next one, my real kind of like a mini segue into that. Um, so you were sending your stuff to various film festivals, which is great. It's wonderful. Um, we're kind of like doing it the very, I would argue the rather difficult way and just sending our pitch to whoever, whatever company will take it. Would it be better for us to slowly like work our way into like sending it to festivals and everything like that, or should we just continue to go about yeah. it however way we can manage? <laughs> yeah, say. yeah. You know, it's it's tough because um, sometimes as an outsider trying to trying to get into the industry by making an entire short is just it's tough because there's kind of all that time that you're making the short. Um, there's so much more stuff involved rather than just storyboarding. So if you're going for for storyboarding. Um, then, you know, suddenly you're, you're working on this whole short for a year, which is great because then at the end of it, you got this cool short that's like, you know, showcases really your talents as a director. But, but probably, realistically, people aren't going to be hiring like a, a director. They're going to be hiring, you know, somebody out of a storyboard artist or a revisionist that can kind of get in at the ground floor and then see, you know, what the show needs so you can kind of learn on the job from, from being there. So, you know, definitely make shorts and, and do stuff, but, but um, you know, definitely like emphasis on, on short kind of, like a small thing is gonna, is gonna hold people's attention if it's really funny and charming versus a long thing. I mean, if you can pull off a 30 minute short that's, you know, that wins an Oscar, that's like, then you can do whatever you want, but it's, um, it's, it's just kind of more of a gamble, definitely. Um, uh, so yeah, that's, that's what I'd say about that. But so much of my, TV boarding experience was just learning on the job, seeing what other people did. And like, it's even hard pitching over Zoom because um, normally you pitch these in a room and you can kind of hear people laughing. You can kind of kind of sense when things are working or when people are kind of like staring at their phones and you're like, oh no, I'm losing them. I gotta, I gotta like punch this up. Um, and then you'll just be, um, if you get staffed on a show, you, you're just, working on so many different episodes too so you have the chance to like get better every episode kind of um, if that all makes sense but, yeah. yeah oh yeah that's yeah. that's perfect thank you we've been like scrambling because i'm just like i got this i got my own stuff i'm working on and i'm like i, I don't know about a whole 30 minute piece but i if you want me to i'll try it but yeah <laughs> but you know keep keep all those ideas too because they you know they come back they come back years later and it doesn't you know, it doesn't hurt to, to do all that stuff. That's what we're going to be doing all the way on the job is just making cartoons. So that's good. That's true. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your question, Michaela. Yeah, I was, yeah. um, was going to kind of jump in after that um, just because that she's working, uh, Michaela's working on this project and you had a lot of projects too. Um, and you mentioned um, just the longevity or just the time involved in putting, putting, together a short like a 30 minute short um is so involved and so um doing something smaller might be more amenable to to showcasing your work but also completing something you think would work too like maybe a two minute short or um that might work too yeah yeah definitely um especially yeah um I, I would say the shorter the better just the shorter the spans. short <laughs> yeah the shorter the short I mean it's you know TikTok is what like 15 seconds or something I um something that really um is going to grab people's attention is just going to be easier to do in like a shorter amount of time I'd say but um that doesn't mean you know stop writing those long things it just means also like figure out a way to kind of do a little bit of everything it's it's tough I don't, I don't know um, there were definitely years where I would just like come home from work and work on my own stuff. And I don't know if that's sustainable in the long run, but um, you know, you just, it's a hustle for sure. It is a hustle. I mean, working for eight hours, like you said, you wake up and your hand is automatically drawing because you're just in that um, almost machine-like mode of drawing. 
constantly. Um, I did want to ask you too about what, um, just what, how intense, because it is intense, I understand, but if you could kind of talk about the intensity of storyboarding a little bit more and how you manage that currently in your own life. Oh, oh boy, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's tough. I would say for a pitch like that, that I did with Mickey, that's an 11 minute episode. And we have, I think, five weeks to kind of storyboard that entire um, episode. Just pretty tough. TV's, um, TV is very fast paced. Um, I'm not sure the fungi is usually like the first kind of week and a half will be thumbnails, kind of just really rough um, sketches. And then kind of that second pitch two weeks later will be kind of like a clean pitch that's a little polished with some like notes and ideas addressed. And then that third pitch is kind of like the, um, the crew pitch where you pitch for everybody. And that's, that's usually pretty clean. Ideally that's, you know, that animation, that storyboard is like ready to ship to animation. Of course, there's like a director pass, you know, it gets put into an animatic and everything. Um, but it's really just, it's not a matter of um, how long is it gonna take to finish it? It's, it's more like when do you abandon it? Cause you have to kind of. But, right. So they don't they don't say how long is gonna is this gonna take you. They say it needs to be done by such and such date. So you have three weeks. Right. Or yeah. However yes. long. And um it's it's sort of more like maybe you don't get it all done, but then there's gonna be more work for people down the line in the production. So you, you gotta be conscious of you know who else is working hard on the crew and who are you kind of giving more work to down the line to illusionists and directors and everything. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, the, you know, the more you can do, it's, it's tough. And every, every show is different and every um, outline is different and the script is different. So um, it's, you just really got to love drawing, I guess. <laughs> you got to love, yeah. It, you said that in the very beginning that you'd mentioned that your, your ideas were really strong, but your drawing skills weren't as good. But you, obviously, when you're drawing that much, your drawing improves over time. Um, and obviously your drawing skills are a heck of a lot stronger <laughs> now. Um, but for, let's say for someone who was interested in storyboarding, and you said that your, your portfolio, what you had put together wasn't kind of maybe what um, a storyboard portfolio would look like. Um, do, you, do you get a chance to look at incoming work at all? Do you have suggestions on what a storyboard portfolio should look like? Right sure, now. sure. Um, yeah, definitely. It's, it's been a, a little while since I've looked at stuff, but I would say, you know, three to four just good scenes of, um, of uh, cartoons is, is great. And ideally, it's sort of, it's going to be a little bit like what you're applying to. You know, I, I know they say like animation isn't a genre, but just for all intents and purposes, like kind of TV animation, you know, it's going to look a certain way. It's going to, um, it's either going to be kind of like more more cartoony or it's going to be a little more kind of action maybe anime based sort of so try and tailor your portfolio to the job you're applying to and um, one of the ways you can do that is just to keep kind of working on these side exercises of saying like okay i want to board this you know one to two minute scene i want to board an action sequence and you know kind of looking at some different um, action sequences, getting some reference, and then just kind of setting a deadline for yourself um, and um, putting together something and then pitch it to friends to see if it makes sense without you having to see what's going on in the storyboard. I think most of all the storyboards, um, we're, we're working for clarity, looking for clarity. So even more than like your drawings getting better, it's, it's important that kind of your storytelling skills get get more clear as you go. But that's a big test. I mean, when I look at storyboards, usually I don't read the dialogue. I'm just, cause I already know just from people's behavior kind of what's going on. Um, maybe if the drawings are really good, I'll go back and read and, and say like, oh, this is really funny too. This, this dialogue is really funny. But um, you're gonna be working with a team of people. So, you know, lines are gonna get punched up by everybody and stuff. But what's really important is those drawings are, they're just really clear, really concise, um, yeah, and, and good. So I would just kind of get on a rotation of, of trying to do a couple of those scenes um, every couple months, and then just making sure when you get something in your, that, you're, that you're proud of, that's really good to, 
to kind of take out that that thing in your portfolio that's maybe not good and replace it with that new thing. Um, just because um, if you put anything in your portfolio that's bad, it's just going to make people confused of like, oh, do they know this is bad or can they tell or is this, did they do it a long time ago? Is this like, um, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's, it's really competitive, but, um, you know, just, just keep at it. Figure drawing is, is really helpful. I would say not to necessarily show figure drawings in your portfolio, but just as a reference, you know, the figure is like the hardest thing to draw. And if you can draw that, then um, it's just a really good foundation um, to draw stuff from life, not necessarily just copy the other cartoons. I'm um, just trying to get that stuff in there that, that is um, really authentic. That's, that's kind of what I look for. But every, every job is different. And um, some people are looking for you know, super cartoony stuff or super, you know, just, just crazy stuff. Or some people don't even know what they want until they see it. So it's, uh, it's tough. Do you think that, so do you think that um, putting together, like you'd mentioned, putting in a few, um, like ex working on a few exercises of uh, different sequences um, and having different types of or genres of sequences would be helpful or perhaps having, um, like you had said, like knowing the, the studio that you're applying for, if you're applying for someplace like Cartoon Network, then making sure that your your sequences are types of sequences that would fit in the, the styles of the show, or at least the humor of the shows that they're that they're that they already have going. Do you think? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know that Cartoon Network just just really wants stuff to be funny. Like at the end, of the day, like even more than they want it to make sense. It's like needs to um needs to be funny if you're applying to some place you know like disney or dreamworks or you know pixar um it's going to be more cinematic it's going to be more emotional and evocative um, it's going to be more about kind of the storytelling almost can you can you show like a story that that also makes you ask a lot of questions and makes you want to like lean in and know more about those characters in that world um is really is really tough to do sometimes mm -hmm. Can you, can you, I was going to ask you, um, you know, but that totally makes sense. Um, you had mentioned that you were pitching a lot of shows and the act of pitching is just what you were doing with us is just showing the boards that you drew and going through the dialogue and running the dialogue and showing it as it's as it's supposed to be shown. Mm -hmm. um, when you're pitching, well, when you had opportunities to pitch um before like your other shows how did that come up and how would um i know the uh, the the act the actual act of pitching standing in front of your boards and telling what the story is to someone is one thing but then i always think of um you know the pitching the idea and putting together the entire package of like what you did for the fungies as a pitch as well so there's i when you say pitch i think of two different things is yeah. that is that correct or is that incorrect? Oh, totally. A pitch is just like trying to sell somebody something. You know, I feel like like an idea or um, you know, a world or something. But you, you just kind of meet people everywhere. I think um, I think it's a really good idea to kind of when you think about networking, um, like meeting people, interacting with people. I think there's always this need to like want to network up to people. Like, hey, I want to pitch. I want to meet the the president of the studio and pitch an idea. But, but sometimes it's, it's more a, better to kind of network out to your peers and cast like a wider net because now you're, you know, like Michaela, you're working with somebody writing, writing a script, that's great. That's gonna be the writer on, on the show that you work on in a year, you know, that has experience doing that. Um, is gonna be easier because those people have more time to listen to you, to interact. You can look at each other's work, you can get better together. And then when there's a spot on a job, you, you know all these people in your network, you have access to um, all these people that you've come up with, who you've seen get better. You've, you've, you know, you've seen these people working their asses off to get jobs and you know that they deserve them. So sometimes that's better than kind of, you know, cold emailing like the president of the studio or something. But, you know, getting the opportunity to pitch can come from anywhere. I, I pitched a Fox once because I, I, got a woman a chair at an awards event. She needed the chair to sit down and I like, got her a chair and she was like, great, do you want to pitch a cartoon? <laughs> um, and I went in the next day to like Fox Studios. I didn't have anything. 
to pitch. I stayed up all night. It wasn't good, but it was just like being ready when that kind of opportunity um, presents itself is really, is really valuable. And you'll get a lot of chances like that and you might not be ready, but it's always good practice to um, kind of just get feedback from people. Um, but I would say most of the offers I get to pitch now are just from like Instagram, just putting stuff on Instagram, putting stuff online. Um, there's just so many ways that, that people um, look for talent these days on the internet is just, you know, you can get your tweets made into a movie if they go viral enough, or sometimes it's easier for execs to see that, oh, this person has a following, so they know what they're doing, even if we don't understand it. There's something to this like movement that, that people are getting sucked into. But um, usually you won't get an offer to pitch until, um, until it happens. And it's just weird. It's like getting an agent. It's like it doesn't happen until after you need it to happen but it will happen at some point if you just keep doing your thing long enough. I don't know if that's helpful at all. Yeah. Thank you. AB, did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask. Um, wait, let me take down my hand. Oh, wow. Anyway, um, what I wanted to ask was, what is the moment in your career that you truly felt that you made it as a storyboard artist? Like, what yeah. was that aha moment that you truly felt like yeah, I don't know if I have felt that way. Yet, I'll be <laughs> honest. I, you know, no? it's like it's like you're um, you work hard at this stuff, and it's you know you do it because you love it. But but um, I don't know. Sometimes I feel very insecure about my drawings and my pitch, and I don't know if that ever really goes away. But I just love the feeling of, of being in a room and you pitch stuff and people laughing. Like that's an amazing feeling when you just are pitching a storyboard and people kind of are entertained from beginning to end. Um, you like go to a different place in your head and it feels fantastic. Um, yeah, when, when that, maybe when I started working in TV, I think that was really fun because it was like, um, it was like what I was doing, I knew was gonna go into the show. It wasn't gonna get like, cut out like, like, you know, um, like gags in a movie or something. So that was really exciting, just being able to contribute really to um to, to cartoons that we're doing but yeah that's a that's a million dollar question thank you Andy. so just so you know so Stephen Pinieri is is insecure about his drawings and he is uh, a showrunner and here we all are students and learning and and we, it's just a thing artists I mean I, I don't know a whole lot of artists who are completely completely 100% secure because it's almost as if once you do something, you have this idea that it could be better or, you know, or maybe, or what if, <laughs> but, you know, it's, just, it's a never ending thing. Um, well, at least it is for me. I don't know how many other people are like that, but um, I don't know how that makes anybody else feel if it makes anybody else a little bit more comfortable just knowing that it's something that it, it just kind of, it doesn't, it doesn't go away. It stays with you. I don't know. It, that makes me feel better. Too, so Does it? Mean? <laughs> it's hard. It's it tough. is hard. Okay. Well, um, I had, uh, we have a question from, this is from Tiffany and um, she's not here, but she, um, and I don't know, I didn't actually look through these beforehand, but I'm going to read them. Um, what is the process? What has the process been for storyboarding for the films you've worked on? How is it? How is it different from Ice Age in two thousand nine to the more recent shows you've boarded? Is the process and how is how different is it from movie movies versus TV shows? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I would say you know feature like I was saying for what I was doing in particular was more like kind of brainstorming, just running with an idea. But I know some people get script pages. Um, but I could go into a little bit kind of what we do on the, on the fungies maybe. Yeah, that'd be great. Of like an outline versus the, the storyboard. Mm -hmm. um, so let me, let me share my screen again. Um, now the, the, the ratio is different for feature than it is to TV. And that because the turnaround for TV is a lot quicker, 
you're doing, you're, you're putting it out really fast. And, and I know at least from the boards that I've seen for feature, they're a lot more cinematic and they're tonal. Um, yeah. They're usually, they're, yeah, they're usually really dramatic in the, the composition or in the, the, the heartfelt emotion and storytelling, things like that. But in terms of what the process is like as an artist for yeah. both those things, it'd be interesting to hear about. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, the fun juice is a, it's called like, um, what is it? Oh, a board driven show, which is kind of becoming a little more rare these days, but um, I'm assuming my dad's uh, But at Cartoon Network, a lot of the shows are board driven, which means rather than starting with a script, you start with um, an outline. Here's, here's an outline for this episode. I think you can watch this on YouTube called New Plan in Town um, that Kelsey wrote. Um, and this is, this is pretty detailed as far as an outline goes, um, but it's sort of just more of a sense of what's going on. So you might have some dialogue, there's kind of an idea of setting, you know, Pan's rock, when is this dinosaur, um, what she's doing, you know, she's scurrying around and then, you know, she runs into Seth, she meets Seth and Seth wants to know about kind of where she lives and what she does all day. You know, can he like shadow her all day? So that might be like the first part of act one and then you know, um, he's doing stuff that Pan does and then Pan gets attacked by a Spinosaurus. So um, they have to run away. And Seth is horrified that she has to like run, you know, and that she's not safe in her life. So that's kind of the second paragraph. And then the third paragraph is Seth's idea. This is kind of the, that turn to act two of like, Seth has this idea. Well, why don't you just live with us in Fungi Town? You know, we'll keep you safe. And um, that way you don't have to run from dinosaurs anymore. You can like sleep in, on a couch and stuff. Um, Pam's a little skeptical, but you know, um, so you can kind of see in the first act that like sets up kind of what the episode is gonna be about a little bit. And then, you know, the second act, it kind of gets more complicated from there. You know, Pam realizes she needs to get a job. Um, she stinks at getting a job because she's a dinosaur. And then the Spinosaurus comes back and then by act three, everybody bands together to protect Pam from the, the dinosaur. So it's, it's sort of like a rough, yeah, an outline is just kind of a guide for what happens. Maybe there's suggestions for dialogue. And then these are drawings that our, our supervising director, Nick Edwards, did of just different ideas. Um, if Pam wants to get a job, maybe she could be like a taxi cab. That's what she ends up being. Maybe this is what the Spinosaurus could look like. Um, kind of the fungies, they can like, stick their bodies together. So maybe by the end, they turn into like uh, another dinosaur to fight this dinosaur. And then from there, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of what the board artists are given to um, basically make, um, make an episode happen. So these boards are by Sonia von Mernstor. She's, she's really amazing. Um, and she just goes through and yeah, draws the outline, but she's got to come up with like different gags and locations for all these places. Um, this was an idea that Pam has this little thing in her head that tells her whatever to like fight or flight when she's in a certain situation, stuff like that, you know, all the visual stuff. Um, maybe there's some like backgrounds that you can you can pull from the background library because you're tired of drawing. Yes, um, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. We use those backgrounds. <laughs> Um, but this is a really this is a really great episode. But you can see versus feature that it's very it's a little bit simpler, um, and it's more about ideally this is a board that you're going to be shipping to a studio overseas, and they're going to use these as you know keyframes basically for the animation. So it it's kind of more like a blueprint, um, and feature boarding is more like kind of a kind of like a tonal guide almost sort of to to what the film could be. Um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, hopefully that, that answers that a little bit. You know. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, and then she added another question. Um, she wanted to know if there were any s online storyboard courses that you would recommend if you knew of any. Um, <laughs> um, do, do you teach a class? There, no, <laughs> no, thanks for, for supporting me. No, I don't. I don't currently teach a storyboarding class. So she was wondering if you knew of any. Or yeah. if, if someone, if someone, okay, look, let's take it then another direction. If someone is, um, so we have a younger student here. If someone is interested in, you know, pursuing storyboarding, 
um, on, you know, in the future. Um, and they're not currently enrolled in a, a college uh, course. Yeah. What are what are some things that someone could work on, um, in just in their own personal sketchbook or their own personal you know thought process that would help them just to get into the mind yeah. frame of becoming a storyboard artist? That's a that's a great question. And also, there is um, this guy Rod Seacrest. He's a really amazing DreamWorks artist. I know he does like an online school, but you know, a good thing to keep in mind is this isn't something you need to go to art school for. Nobody's ever gonna ask to see your degree. No, nobody is, don't, please don't pay too much for school because it all it's just a lot of pressure to put on yourself that you don't need. So there are so many, um, there are a lot of classes out there. I'm not too familiar with a ton of them that are run by just industry professionals who just wanna teach straight to the artists. Cause we're all working in animation, we know we know that storyboard artists are in demand. And if you can find a good storyboard artist, it's really, it's super helpful. So, you know, just really looking at shows you like and going on Twitter and Instagram and just kind of um, creeping up on people, like what they're posting, what stuff do you like? You know, what stuff is good? What stuff does everybody else good? There's so many um, directors who post like um, storyboarding guides and everything. Um, I think I have one, just a big sheet of different references that I can I can send to you there so that you can oh, that'd be send great. your students. Um, but yeah, everybody just wants to um, kind of show off what they know and help other people. Um, as far as, as like exercises you can do, um, a great one is just watching like a movie and copying the shots in the movie. That's really good. Um, especially if it's like a live action movie, trying to um, get those like proportions right within the frame. Um, and really just studying films to see um, you know, how often do they cut, you know, looking at stuff like the 180 degree rule when you're cutting, a, you know, how to stage just like a simple conversation of two people talking back and forth is something that's really super valuable as a storyboard artist that you're gonna use probably every day of your life. Um, that's, that's really helpful. That's kind of what I did. Um, and then just, yeah, the drawing again is just really helpful. Um, Comics too, I mean, comics are amazing. There's some great comics out there. Um, and just looking at how people kind of tell stories like concisely is really, is really interesting. Yeah, I, I would definitely second the, what you said about um, watching, watching movies and uh, copying them shot by shot. That's exactly what I did as well. Um, studied Casablanca and you know a lot of black and white films and things like that. And really yeah. paying attention to the compositions of the shot and um, the lighting, well, more in black and white things, but just, yeah, the, and the, the sequences and the, sh the how they cut, things like that. That's, mm -hmm. those are really great things to do. Um, um, I'm trying to, don't be afraid to like just trace the, the frame, you know, just really, like it's fine you know it's okay you're not doing these to like put in your portfolio these are, these are for you so you really you know just muscle memory get, get that stuff in there that's really good that you mentioned that because yeah it really is about under just simply tracing the shot is really about understanding the positive and negative spaces between your characters and the open spaces and just how things are how things are laid out in that particular shot your shot, your your boards are hilarious and they're really funny. And and the I think the the magical thing about it um, is that and I and I've said this before is that when you're drawing in such a way that you're communicating that the artist is now we're all bought in to what it is is happening. We're you know we're following the story. We're following the emotion we're following, um, what the characters are saying, we're not seeing pictures anymore. Yeah, you know, yeah, you're, you're caught up in the story. You know, yeah. you're looking, you know, you're looking at like a cartoon character look off screen and you're like, oh, what are they looking at? You know, but that none of that stuff is there. It's all, it's all right. Fake. It's all imagined, right? That's the, yeah. the amazing thing. So if you can get, if, if you're, if you're a student, studying storyboarding you want to get your pitches and your boards to a point where you're not where like you'd said that it's it's about clarity and it's not about you know the beautiful drawings but it's about you know how moving the story forward and and um telling that story and getting the the, the viewer really actively involved in it i think mm -hmm. yeah definitely
Mark Bentz, you are here. Thanks for being here. Did you have a question, Mark? May I unmute myself? Yes. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I, you both mentioned and you lit up when you said background library. What's that about? I'm very curious. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Stephen. Oh, yeah. Um, just a library of backgrounds literally on the server that have already been in the episode. So you can kind of um, just recycle stuff <laughs> and uh, say like, hey, well, you're always outside of Seth's house. Let's just put it in there. You don't need to redraw it. You can just draw them later that stuff. Or if you want to reference it, if you want to think about, OK, we need another angle on this. But I already have this angle. So if we can draw the other angle, then we'll kind of have both, both sides covered, if that makes sense. Yeah. So so there's scenes that you've come up with that you put in your personal library. I thought it was like a place you can go to, like oh, if you're creating. Like the Boston, the Boston, the Boston, say, the Boston yeah. background library. Yeah, yeah. But, background you know, library. Google Earth is amazing. There's a lot of stuff on Google Earth. You can walk okay. around on streets. You can, um, you know, I, I don't yeah. know if anybody saw that show Invincible at all on Amazon Prime. It's like a superhero show. There's so much like building stuff and everything. Like I'm sure yeah. artists were all over Google Earth, just like looking at buildings and kind of like roughing in, you know, blocks of stuff. Um, oh. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So, something that you were talking about, Lois. I, was, I remembered. I just kind of like collect stuff too, um, even just for reference. And I just found this little. This is kind of stupid on my. Let me show my screen real quick. Just even like shows you like, um, I don't know if you can see this, like Star Trek. Um, this is the episode where Data decides she wants to have a beard. <laughs> you know, this is a storyboard. It's like, did you damage your face, Data? It's a beard, Jody, a full, fine, dignified beard, one which commands respect um, and projects thoughtfulness and dignity. Like that's just like a, you could put that straight in Adventure Time or something. It's just so bizarre because you know who those characters are. And it's, it's yeah. really, I'm sorry. I, maybe, maybe no, that's a great, know, that's sorry. a great aside. It's, it's, uh, it is, it's really important to, to, to create kind of a visual library of the stuff that you're really interested in and that, that gets you excited. Um, let's see, I was going to go to back to the questions. Um, oh, for animation, are you using Maya or Toon Boom Harmony? What 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 software are you using? I don't know. I don't know. I, for <laughs> storyboarding, we use Toon Boom. We do. Um, and then I think our overseas studio, Seiram Animation, I think they only just switched to Harmony recently. But before that, they were just all drawing on paper. I was kind of compositing mm, okay. different things. But um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't matter too much either. I know like Blender is free. I mean, I think that's expensive, but um, I think just for storyboarding, it's just it's all about the drawings. So you can you can do that on paper too. It's not a big deal. Yeah, no, definitely you can't. Um, let's see here. We had another question. Um, this is uh, in your experience with starting a blog, web comic, or web show. Be great for newcomers interested in visual storytelling, writing, storyboarding, and animation to get their feet wet. Yeah, definitely. I think making comics is um, is a great way. I I started making comics um, just to put on Instagram just for fun, and it's been just a really great way to learn more about storytelling. It's just something I do as an exercise. Let me see if I have any here. Um, just coach really quickly. But you know, comics are so much like storyboards, and especially with um, with Instagram, where you have to swipe every panel, it's really fun to, um, you know, just make little things. These are just little things I'll draw in my sketchbook. Um, if Stacey says, oh, no. you, you, it's me, if you can You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Yeah, right, you never get angry. And then I, <laughs> I, I turn into angry. It's, not, it's not healthy, it's, um, it's a person. Um, but yeah, stuff like that. Um, let me see if I have any other ones. This is, um, it's great to just write down stuff that happens in your day too. It's funny if you wanna take inspiration from that. Um, whenever I go visit my mom, she 
um, we have a very specific um, relationships. <laughs> I try and just write down what she says and it keeps me from going too nuts. Like, you know, the car. <laughs> and, and that Martha Stewart, she's a marketing genius. But why does she wear such baggy shirts? I think it's a ploy to appeal to the American woman. She owns one of the original Ford houses in Michigan. I'm sure she's ruined it, turned it into Martha Stewart's pancake palace. And I just want to know, I'm like driving past a cemetery, who writes down all those recipes in her magazines and doesn't get any credit? And I'm just driving. <laughs> she was like, Your dad's friend is buried over there. <laughs> so just, yeah, writing down stuff in your day is really is fun sometimes and you get a little bit of practice out of it. And then uh, you can look back years later and think of that, that car ride. I think that's fantastic. I, I definitely am all for mining your own personal life in terms of storytelling. I know I have done that in my own personal life. And it's just, and I do that with, um, and I do that in the classes that I teach in my kids' classes. In fact, we just did a, car, a cartoony for comics class today with these little kids and this little girl was the first grader. She, her story was about um, asking, it was a four panel comic and she asked her mom, is it Wednesday? And her mother said, yes, it's Wednesday. And because Wednesday's pancake day for dinner. And it was just super cute because, it, and she didn't even, she didn't even write the word pancakes. She's, she's in first grade. She's not a very, she's not very good at, at writing her, all of her letters. So she had just had done the dialogue bubble and just drew pancakes with a question mark. Yeah. Yeah. And then the mom responded with pancakes in the same drawn pancakes wow. in the bubble exclamation mark. And it was just brilliant. Yeah. This really little cute. first grader, yes. it was super cute. That's um, so you started, you know, you've got a huge following on Instagram. You've been posting your um, comics on Instagram for a long time. When did you first start doing that? Uh, maybe like three years ago, just kind of for fun. But um, yeah, you know, it was just a cool way to kind of, in animation, it takes like nine months to a year to make a cartoon. So by the time it's out, you know, and you post stuff about, you want to share stuff, it's like, it's, it's, you know, it's over. So um, I think sometimes, yeah, Instagram is cool just to get an immediate reaction of like, what's funny and what people like and what's working for people. Um, Cause we all just want to like share our stuff and, and make other people laugh. So it's been, it's been really fun. Yeah. Okay, that's awesome. Um, let's see two, um, we have just a few more minutes and I just had a couple more questions. Um, what role do you see new media playing in your industry? Oh my gosh, I guess everything is just is streaming now. Everything is, um, yeah, it's crazy. There's just so much content that everybody wants. And I don't know if that's gonna last forever, but it's nice right now. It's just everybody um, really wants to see cartoons. There's been this pandemic, so we're all working from home and animation has been one of the few things that can kind of continue unaffected for the past year. Um, so if anything, it's just more, I mean, there's also, you know, stuff like you know, VR, video games, everybody kind of needs artists. And um, it's kind of like everybody is like a storyteller now, you know, <laughs> like I'm not just a video game designer, I'm a storyteller. Um, so I, I guess new media, there's just more and more. Um, I, I don't see myself like moving out of like cartoons anytime soon, but it's really cool that it's there. And people are making cool stuff, I think. So yeah, do you see yourself working in cartoons, uh, you know, doing what you're doing? You've got your, I mean, you it took you, you said it eight years from when you first developed the fungies to to having that become a created show. So this is your this is your baby, kind of your you're not your real life baby, but your your animation baby um so yeah how long do you see yourself doing this or do you see what else do you see in your future yeah i mean i would love to try some other stuff i think um this has been really fun it's just it's a lot of work so you know it's cool to make more comics and that's when you kind of practice i would i would love to make a graphic novel or um, a movie um i would love to um just maybe sleep for a year or two since having a baby so um <laughs> I just, you know, I kind of do the same thing I do every day. I just write down a bunch of stuff in my sketchbook. And, um, you know, once it starts to accumulate, try and write out longer stuff into um, like outlines and scripts and stuff. 
and we'll see where it leads. So you would you recommend that then too? I mean, you mentioned the, the just developing all these stories, and you have so many different ideas um, that you were just kind of working on designing things like that. So some something that you would recommend, like once you have these ideas, to get them down and start just designing or just getting them out of your brain and putting them on paper. Yeah, absolutely. Just um, you know, keeping a sketchbook and. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be precious either. I want to be like precious with your pages. Just get your ideas out there. Um, and yeah, just, just play and have fun as if you're a kid. And um, yeah, just, it just takes a while. Just keep drawing, guys. Just keep drawing. All right, well, does anybody else have any last questions for Steven? No? Thanks. Okay. Thanks well, you know what? This has been really fantastic. I'm just looking to see if there's any other questions. I think that was pretty much it. Well, I want to tell, take the time to, oh, wait, look, we have Alexandria's got her hand raised. Alexandria, did you have a question? We can kind of squeak it in. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Absolutely. How do you use um, negative space to best tell a story? I don't know. Gosh, I don't know. Um, I think just maybe um, it's a matter of like framing, making sure that that characters have like clear silhouettes sometimes. So, you know, if you're if you're showing a character like pointing at something, just making sure that that is like legible. You know, with with negative space. Um, if, if you were to fill in like the space around this character, you'd still know that they're like pointing at something, right? Um, which isn't to say that's the only way to do it. Like you, could, um, you could maybe also have them point. Sorry, now I'm, now I'm drawing. It's yeah, I was going to say he's drawing now. The negative space is like the is is basically just the area around your 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 yeah. objects and your your characters to show to make sure that everything's clear. Yeah. So you might you might have this character kind of like shyly pointing, um, which is great if that's like a conscious character choice. But um, in terms of negative space, something like this is going to like stick out more and be more clear um, at a glance if it's like a quick shot. Um, versus something like that. So it's just something to keep in mind. You know, there are like there are rules and stuff. You can break all the rules. There's no there's no like strict way to do stuff. But it's also like most of those rules are kind of there for for a reason. Usually, I hope that's. I don't know. I can't think of any other examples off the top of my head. So I was like, yeah, that, that, makes that helps. That makes sense. Thank you so much. No, that's a great. Oh, phew. Yes. <laughs> you answered yes. the question. Thanks for your question, Alexandra. Well, um, thank you, Stephen, so much for spending this time with us um, to share your experience as an animation artist and how you made your way into the world and um, sharing your work with us. We, I think we all really enjoyed it. Would you guys we do this little kind of applause thing <laughs> to show Thanks, our appreciation thank for Stephen? Thanks so much and for having me. Yes, and um, so yes, uh, you guys support Steven, watch the Fungies on Cartoon Network. And um, if you're not following him, I posted his uh, Instagram on in the Discord, but what's the, uh, what's your Instagram handle is? Oh, it's just Steven P. Neary. It's yeah. just Steven P. Neary. So yeah, make sure you're following him. He, may, he does these adorable, a, adorable um, comics about his life with his baby and his mom and um, just everyday life and I think those are really inspirational too and if you can and by the way you do those in just in your sketchbook and with watercolor yeah yeah they're just um just little squares little just, squares they're super yeah. fun so anyway thank you so much for being here and thank you everyone else for being here too I'll let you go Stephen have a great day everyone else you guys have a great day and we'll see you in class thanks everybody thanks for having thanks, me Stephen. Nice to meet you. all right we'll see you guys Bye. Bye.